The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them out into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw the others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing idle here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, am I doing you no I am doing you no more no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious of because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. I'll begin by offering my semi-heretical statement of the day, and then I'll explain it a little bit. God is messy. Okay, well... God is messy, not because God is messy. God is messy because we, as humans, are messy. And we can only view the abundance and blessings of God through the lens of messy human beings. And sometimes it's important for us to remember that because we, as humans, have a certain specific nature. And there are at least two of them. One of them is the nature with which we were created, that is that innate God-given talents and nature and familiarity and the want to be in community with others. And then we have our nature, which is that which is nurtured, which is developed in community or in some communities over time. And often through the experience that we have in a world which for the most part, isn't fair, at least in God's eyes. And so the world that we find ourselves in is alien somewhat to us, at least as Christians and as believers. And as a reminder, an a- something which is alien is something which is not from a specific location. When we think of extraterrestrials, those who come in their UFOs and come and land and are working among us, unaware, but they can also be people from other places or people with different perspectives or people who are not exactly like we are or who don't think like we do. And yet we always bump up against God's nature and God's nature is constant. God's nature is promised. It's a relationship with creation. And, our relation, and God's relationship with us has no context. God doesn't like us more because we work harder. God doesn't like us more because we work less. God likes all people the same. And God is challenging to us as we perceive God because we don't understand 
the breadth and the depth of God's love. For humans, God's nature is alien because, of course, it is not of this world. God's nature is outside of this world. And yet our Bible tries to reinforce to us who live in this time and place the true nature of God, even when God's nature has to be viewed through human eyes. Our Bible does this using parables. And the parables that we hear in the Bible are open-ended stories about God. And most often are offered without a key, that magic key that allows us to interpret. Well, this person is supposed to be this person and this person is supposed to be this person. That's not the way the parables are given to us. They're, they are given to us to allow us to use our imagination and our context. And yet, to understand the story, we need to understand the original context, especially when we ask questions about the story. Because the, knowing the context helps us identify God in the story, not what we think God is about or what, how God will work in the story, but how God is actually represented in the story. Today's parable about the generous landowner can be a challenging story. And it's a story which can be troubling for a lot of reasons because the parable begs questions about fairness, about justice, about motivation. Why did the landowner give to the last as much as he gave to the first who had worked hard through the day? What motivated the landowner to hire those first ones first and the last ones last? Why didn't he hire them all if he had work for all? What is it about God or what is it about the landowner and how was he being fair to those people who work so hard during the day? And if we don't have to work like those who were hired at five and still get the same daily pay, why do we work? But we can't let the questions that we ask about the story detract from the truth. It is a story which relates the nature of God's reign and God's nature in relationship with people. And without specifying unimportant details about our perception of God's reign. And in today's story, scholars can come up with at least five different themes which a preacher could address. Some are more worthy and some are probably, in my opinion, and in my bias, less worthy. All of these themes can be reasonably argued and even rationalized to describe God's reign. But I think one overarching theme is highlighting to us who are people of abundance, the vulnerable position of the least in society. In this story, those day laborers who often do meaningful and essential work out of sight and in marginal conditions. And one enduring point I want us to look at or invite us to look at is how we gauge fairness and justice objectively. Because God's fairness and God's justice is in fact exactly that, fair and just. So what is the story that we hear today? Or well, where does it come from? Or how does this fit into the story of the Bible and the story of the gospel? Well, Jesus has been telling stories to his society that human power, wealth, and advantage don't hold sway in God's realm. Remember, God's standards are not human standards. And yet, human power, wealth, and advantage can shine a light on God's desires for creation outside of human distortion. Because the landowner in the story has enough to pay everybody the same daily, the normal daily wage, he chooses to do so. Much of the focus on today's par parable is, is on the generosity of the landowner. The landowner over time is hypothesized and most likely God in the story. 
and yet the conventional wisdom and our 20% of it sensibilities miss things in the translation from the original story to the other. The story talks about workers who stand idle in the marketplace. And it's not so much that they aren't willing to work in the original story. Those workers were in the marketplace willing to do the hard work of working in the vineyard and nobody cho chose to hire them. Their presence was a sign of the willingness to do the hard work that was required of them. And their presence later in the day was more a comment on the unemployment which they found, the underemployment which the, the day laborer was subject to. It was less a comment on laziness. They were willing and able to work, to toil, to do the hard work. And nobody would allow them to do that for them. And so the landowner, out of his compassion, gives what is needed, not what is expected. As we recite every Sunday, and hopefully on more than one day a week, in the Lord's Prayer we ask, give us this day our daily bread. The landowner in the story is in fact doing that, providing what is needed because it is right. One point of the parable that we need to remember as we think about how God is calling us to work is God provides from God's abundance what we need to survive and to be able to be part of God's plan. What God gives us allows us to be a part of God's plan. No matter our own perceived lack of worthiness or lack of standing in the human world, God's providence is enough for us to do God's work. The challenges that we will face and we continue to face in, in our ministry and in the life that we live is remembering that God's promises are eternal. Human understanding gets in the way of, of the God's promises of justice and fairness. What is just and fair in human communities is not always cut and dry. Like the story of the landowner, the balancing of profession, performance, and motivation complicates our understanding of God's desires for the community. Just because the laborers only work one or two hours doesn't make them less worthy, and yet those who worked through the day felt that they were cheated for some reason. The messiness of our relationship with God and others in our world comes from us. We aren't God, no matter how hard we try to make that case. But we should be comforted. The work that we do to honor God's command to love God and to love others is effective for God's command and God's mission and for bringing God's reign justice and fairness to the world that we live in. No matter how failing or faltering that we feel that we are, the work that we do in God's name for God's purpose is effective for God. And we need to invite ourselves to look beyond what we perceive that we lack and to focus on the abundance that we have. Because each of us has abundance, even if we don't recognize it, and even if we don't know what that abundance might be. Because we are able to provide for others what they need. Sometimes it's simply things like acceptance, listening to people's stories and helping them navigate the troubles of their own life. Or it might be a sanctuary, a place where they can come and feel safe, or it might just be a listening spirit, one which doesn't judge the other for what they say or do, but simply for being present with who they are and letting them share their story, their fears, and their hopes. And sometimes, yes, in fact, it includes charity, giving of those monies and things that we have which others need. And there are many other things which God calls us to do and share from the bounty that we have been given. And yet the thing that we need to remember is that we can in fact be generous 
and not judge people simply because they don't look exactly like us. The understanding of how the kingdom works must be open to the way that God actually works in God's kingdom. God's preference for the least is not a categoric judgment against those who have more. It simply reinforces God's preference for all of creation, not those who are worthy by human standards, or, but includes all of those, the least and the most, which are human terms. God wants everybody to be saved. Our job is to be fair and just because that's how we highlight God's guidance and presence today and forever in the abundance that we have and in the scarcity that we might understand or experience. And yet God is with us in the messiness that we inflict on our lives. How is God challenging you to allow God to remove the messiness from your life today, tomorrow, and forever? Listen to how God invites you to be open to God's presence now and forever. Amen. Amen.